All right, today we're going to talk about immobilizing long bones. Um, we're going to be utilizing the guidelines from the National Registry Skill Sheet to make sure that you are able to do this appropriately. Um, you guys can refer to the joint immobilization video, which is going to be very closely related to this also for some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, but I like to emphasize that when we are immobilizing a joint or a long bone in this case, we're going to be doing this likely for a conscious patient, not for an unconscious patient. If we have an unconscious patient, we need to find out if there's any life threatening ish injuries um, beforehand before we decide to, to treat that, that injury. So Matt, here's my patient. It looks like Matt's got some kind of an injury. Um, anytime that we're approaching any kind of a situation where we're going to be making patient contact, we do, we do need to maintain that the scene is safe for ourselves and our, and our partner. And we need to utilize um, proper PSI precautions utilizing PPE, whether that's gloves, goggles, gowns, whatever we feel that is appropriate given the, the situation. So after all those two things are in place and we approach the patient, we do want to do a good assessment and, and make sure um, that this is the only injury or, or find out where that injury, the extent of that injury. So, um, Matt, looks like you might have an arm injury. I broke my arm. Broke your arm. Where did you break your arm, you think? Where is it? Right, right, most right where I'm holding. Right where you're holding? Yeah. Okay, when we, assess for, um, an in, when we assess an injured extremity, we don't need to start where the patient indicates that it's painful, but we do want to make sure that he doesn't have pain anywhere else. Have any pain in your shoulder, no. upper arm, no. elbow? Uh, okay. No. Any pain in your hand or your fingers? No. Okay. So it sounds like the only injury is going to be here, right there in the middle of his forearm. So there's lots of different materials that you can use to splint. Today we're going to um, talk about using something called SAM splint. SAM splints are a great orthopedic adjunct that we have in EMS. Um, basically, what it is, it's a piece of formable aluminum wrapped in styrofoam to give uh, protection. Um, the other nice part about SAM splint is it gives a guide of how to properly use it right on the front of the actual splint itself. Um, when you're using a SAM splint, when it's flat like this, it doesn't have a lot of structural rigidity. But if you read the instructions, what you have to do is you have to put some curves into it and some bends to actually make the aluminum maintain its form. So when you do that, it doesn't bend as much, while down here on the flat part it's still fairly pliable. It also gives some basic ways that you can use a splint. Um, this way I'm going to use something that's on the front here. It's called a sugar tong splint. It's very, very simple to make. This is going to fully encompass around his elbow, all the way through his forearm, up here. Because when we're immobilizing a, a long bone, we need to remember that we have to immobilize a joint above the injured extremity side, or more proximal, and a joint distal or a joint away. So before we do that, though, we also need to assess his PS, uh, PMS, CSM. Essentially, you need to assess for circulation, sensor, and motor. So we need to check the pit to see if there's a, a pulse distal from the injured part of the extremity. He does have a good radial pulse. We also want to check for M, which is movement. Can you move your fingers? Perfect. Can, can you feel me touching your fingers? Mm -hmm. Any numbness, tingling? No. No. Wonderful. So. The way I'm going to do the sugar tong splint, which is a good way to secure everything, a joint above and joint below, is it's just going to go on the underside like this. Okay, it's going to lock up around his elbow. And we're going to put those curves in, in the splint itself to make sure that we can maintain some structural rigidity. Okay, when we're doing this, it's not a bad idea to let the patient know. This is going to be a little uncomfortable as we're forming the splint because we do have pressure in spots that might be already painful. And then we're going to use, I like to use Curlix to help secure it, okay? I like to hold the roll with the, the working end coming out, out from the under part because I think it allows you to get some better control. Oops. Sometimes that happens, no big deal. And we're just going to secure the splint to his arm. I'm going to wrap up around the elbow and lock that in place. Come down here. You can take the other end of your uh, curlix roll or you can just tuck it under here and tie it off to make sure it's nice and secure. 
After we're done, we're going to immediately go and check PMS again. So sometimes it's hard with a splint on to check a radial pulse. Another way you can check for um, good perfusion is capillary refill. Push on the nail bed of uh, one of his fingers and make and see if it pinks up, goes from white to pink in about less than two seconds, two to three seconds. If you can feel a distal pulse, that's fine too. Go ahead and can you wiggle your fingers still? Any numbness or tingling? And you can feel me touching your fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's the way that we determine that what we just did didn't make the situation worse or that the patient hasn't had an acute change. Once it's like this, this can be a little uncomfortable for the patient. So if you guys want to put them into a sling to help uh, provide some more stability and comfort for the patient, that's totally acceptable. And you guys can refer to the joint mobilization video where we talk about sling swap. Okay, another way that we can uh, splint a forearm or a wrist injury is uh, just taking the same SAM splint and uh, kind of folding it in half to kind of shorten the length of it. Taking one end and kind of rolling this up to give the patient something to hold on to. Putting in your bends in it to create the structural rigidity and placing this under the arm. Like so. Then we would go through the same thing. You want to secure the splint. Again, remember to check your CSM before you apply the splint and then directly afterwards. And then you just go secure this, making sure that we're trying to secure this uh, splint. One bone above the injured, injury site and one bone, bone below it. All right, so this is another option for splinting. Um, a lot of agencies still use this simply because they're an affordable option as an orthopedic adjunct. These are cardboard splints. They're literally just a piece of cardboard um, with a piece of foam that's kind of glued to one side to provide a little bit of comfort for the patient instead of just a piece of cardboard. Um, they come in multiple different sizes. Um, given the fact that we're still splinting this forearm injury, we're gonna find one that's most applicable to that. So this is just gonna go in here. Um, things to be aware of, some limitations with the cardboard splint. Obviously, because it's a paper product, if it gets bloody, if it gets wet, the splint can lose its structural integrity. And depending on what you're splinting and the size of the splint that you're utilizing, you might have to pad up some of the voids that you might find that are created, the void space that's not actually touching the actual extremity. So keep that in mind. Um, in terms of attaching these, you can still use the same roll of acrylics. Attach this around. Okay, we're just going to attach that. Now I'm going to say immediately that this splint is just a little short for the arm, so it's probably not going to achieve the goal that we want, which is securing that bone, um, that bone one joint above and one joint below. So we may have to do something else like putting that patient into a sling or a swath to also secure the elbow. And all of this stuff can be done um, in conjunction with each other.